Chapter Thirty Two of The Widow Married, a sequel to The Widow Barnaby by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty Two Rumor and Its Consequences A Confidential Interview Between a Mother and Daughter A Courageous Resolution Taken and Acted Upon a large dinner-party assembled at general hubert's after the drawing-room chiefly consisting of family connections most of whom had that morning paid their compliments at st james and all of whom were amongst the guests invited to mrs o'donagough's ball at night there had been too much vexation endured by mrs hubert and her daughter in the morning for either of them willingly to have discussed the cause of it and if their feelings only had been consulted the names of mrs and miss o'donagough would most assuredly never have been mentioned but sir edward stephenson who knew nothing of all this no sooner perceived that the ice-plates were all removed the grapes duly circulated and the door closed upon the last of the attendants then he said addressing himself to mrs hubert at whose right hand he was seated i have been excessively vexed to-day my dear agnes indeed i am very sorry to hear it she replied may i ask the cause of your vexation sir edward yes you may and i will tell it you frankly that boy seymour whom notwithstanding all our quarrels i love as if he were my own son is most decidedly acting either like a fool or a knave i cannot tell you half the disappointment and vexation this causes me i thought him such a noble-hearted fellow and gave him credit for so intelligent and so refined a mind that what i have seen to-day has surprised as much as it has pained me what is it that you are saying edward with so very grave a face said general hubert i think i heard something about surprise and pain is the communication a secret between you and agnes i hope nothing has happened seriously to vex you yes but there has hubert replied sir edward in an accent that showed he was very much in earnest but the cause of my vexation is very far from being a secret now and even if it were there is no sort of probability that it should long continue so there is not one of us i believe who has not the honour of knowing mrs and miss o'donagough nor is there one who does not know something more or less of my late ward sir henry seymour therefore good friends you are all fully competent to judge of the degree of pleasure with which i should see sir henry bestow himself and his noble fortune on the young lady i have just mentioned nonsense sir edward exclaimed the general indignantly i too have heard this inconceivably silly report but i really never expected that i should hear it repeated by you nor would you hubert had i not this day seen what too strongly confirms it to leave me the same comfortable conviction of its falsehood which i enjoyed this morning it was muckleberry who first told me that the infatuated boy had engaged himself to that tremendous-looking miss o'donagough whose very beauty is revolting and whom i should have thought completely formed to disgust seymour instead of captivating him for which reason i ventured rather cavalierly to assure his lordship that he was mistaken and even when he gravely repeated that he knew the fact from the very best authority i still wholly disbelieved it but you know what the adage says on the article of seeing it is not on the testimony of lord muckleberry or that of any lord or lady breathing that i would have believed henry seymour capable of such preposterous folly but when i beheld him this morning marching through the crowd at st james with the inconceivable mother on one arm and the indescribable daughter on the other i knew not what to think for must it not be some feeling greatly approaching madness which could induce such a man as sir henry seymour to make such an exhibition of himself it was doubtless extremely simple and extremely civil of him replied general hubert but it surely is hardly sufficient to justify your belief that he is going to marry the young lady but that is not the worst of it where he had been taking them or what he had been doing with them heaven knows but it was i should think nearly an hour after i had seen the trio pass in the manner i have described that i at last got downstairs after having been detained by meeting an old acquaintance from berlin whom i had not seen for years and there at the bottom of the staircase in a corner as much as possible out of sight i found sir henry and his fair young friend tete-a-tete -tete, long after the great majority of the company had driven off the girl too was hanging on his arm in a sort of familiar way that i cannot bear to think of because it convinces me that even if he be not fool enough to think of marrying her he has been wicked enough to make her believe he does and the difference between the two is hardly worth discussion 
said mrs hubert suddenly rising and giving lady stephenson the mystical glance which makes it law that all the ladies present should instantly rise too general hubert looked surprised at this unusually early retreat are you going to leave us already agnes said he yes we are general by your good leave she replied the morning has been a fatiguing one for elizabeth and i really dare not propose leaving her at home this evening therefore i mean to deposit her upon a sofa till it is necessary to attend mrs o'donagough's festivities whether general hubert's rapid glance towards his daughter when these words were spoken threw any light upon this movement might have been doubtful to all but his wife but she perfectly well understood the feeling that led him without any further questionings to open the door for them and which caused him as she passed to snatch her hand and wring it with strong emotion yet agnes had never even to him betrayed her suspicions respecting the feelings of elizabeth's young heart towards sir henry seymour nor did he guess them now to their full extent but he thought he had seen very decided proofs of admiration on the part of the young man towards his daughter and though he wished a year or two might elapse and give them time to know each other before any thought of marriage was alluded to he had been for some time watching every trait in his character with deep interest and had begun to contemplate the idea of a near and dear connection with him as an event that he should not only approve but very cordially rejoice in most distasteful therefore was the rumour which had reached him from more than one quarter of sir henry seymour's devotion to miss o'donagough and steadfastly did he believe the thing to be impossible till he saw the effect which the repetition of it produced on his wife but whatever feelings of vexation and displeasure it might have caused the general to hear such news confirmed its effect on his wife was much more painful still she knew though he did not that her elizabeth was no longer fancy-free and though the conviction of this came too late for any caution on her part to do much good her anxiety on the subject was lessened if not altogether removed by the conviction that the young man was devotedly attached to her and that he was one to whom she could entrust the happiness of her heart's dearest treasure with confidence such being the case it must be superfluous to state that the report of sir henry's attachment to her cousin had been listened to with a very anxious mixture of fear and incredulity but improbable as it appeared to her so many circumstances had occurred to confirm it that when she left the dinner-table the incredulity had pretty nearly vanished while the fear was strengthened almost into certainty had it not been however for caroline's strange conduct and subsequent agitation when the subject was named mrs hubert would still have been inclined to doubt not only the truth of all she had heard but also the testimony of sir edward's eyes but her imagination could suggest no other interpretation of miss seymour's emotion than that her heart revolted from the connection her brother was about to form though her devoted love for him led her to assume a degree of civility towards the young lady which was altogether foreign to her feelings during the few days that the poor girl remained in berkeley square after the visit of mrs o'donagough and her daughter she had appeared so dreadfully embarrassed whenever they were spoken of that the subject had been dropped by mrs hubert from mere pity and now that she was gone to visit friends at some distance from london the recollection of all she had said and all that she seemed ashamed to say did more to strengthen the report than anything she could have done or said had she remained with them on reaching the hall elizabeth took a side candle from the slab and proceeded with it to her own room and thither in a few minutes afterwards her mother followed you are ill my dearest child said mrs hubert on perceiving her sitting pale and motionless while large tears were sadly coursing each other down her cheeks my darling elizabeth tell me what is passing in your mind trust me sweet love you will feel the better for it mamma how can i tell you what i am unable to explain even to myself i would not wish to have a secret from you if i have been weak and foolish i would rather you knew it than not dearest mother but i cannot tell how it has all come about i did not think that i could have been no and i do not think so now so very weak so very foolish so everything that i should most dislike to be as to fancy myself in love and that too with a person who is loving another all the time oh mother your daughter ought not to be so vile as that the vilest does not rest with you my child replied mrs hubert with strong emotion you believed yourself beloved and had reason to believe it but this is a theme on which i feel that i must never dare to speak with you elizabeth the impression will soon be effaced believe me it will you shake your head but you cannot shake my belief dearest i speak with perfect confidence if you have loved this man it was because he appeared to you as he did to me worthy of your love now we find that he is not so 
your feelings towards him will change and that so completely as to make you doubt that you ever entertained them that may be but when shall i forget mamma that my forward vanity mistook what i suppose was friendship for his sister's friend for love it is not my love for him but my contempt for myself that will make me miserable you will see this matter in a different light a little while hence elizabeth and that different light will be the true one but as yet this is perhaps impossible and i will not harass your spirits now by disputing about it perhaps dearest it will be best that you should not go to this detestable ball to-night there are enough of us assembled here all desperately bent upon the enterprise to satisfy the claims of relationship were she ten times our aunt indeed it will be best that you should remain quietly at home it would be a great deal best for my pleasure mamma but unless you insist upon my staying at home i had rather go there may be much to try your spirits my dear child and it is quite clear they are not very strong to-night neither you nor i should choose that anything you may chance to feel should be suspected trust me said elizabeth beseechingly i will trust you my sweet girl you shall go or stay just as you like best at the moment there is no occasion to decide about it yet if i were you dearest i would lie down claridge can easily arrange your hair again elizabeth silently nodded her assent and after fondly kissing her pale cheek her mother left her on returning to the drawing-room mrs hubert found the whole party consisting of lady stephenson and her sister-in-law nora mrs henderson elizabeth peters and two miss nivets whom by some of her skilful manoeuvrings mrs o'donagough had contrived to inscribe on her visiting list in high and almost loud debate concerning the possibility of sir henry seymour's having fallen in love with miss o'donagough lady stephenson gave it as her opinion that all things were possible but that the thing under discussion was not probable mrs henderson observed that after the scene she had witnessed between miss seymour and the o'donagough ladies she could entertain no doubt whatever of the truth of the report they had heard inasmuch as the young lady's conduct was perfectly natural upon that theory and perfectly unintelligible upon every other miss peters declared that though mrs o'donagough was her aunt by marriage she must say that she thought her more likely than any one she ever knew to take in a young man and make him marry her daughter whether he would or not the two miss nivets both followed on the same side first one and then the other remarking that nothing occurred so constantly as instances of men being drawn in to marry odious disagreeable women and exactly the very sort of people they most disliked by mere art and good management and that was the reason to their certain knowledge why so many admirable young women remained single just because they would not condescend to do the same sort of things themselves as both these young ladies were considerably past thirty their judgment had naturally much weight but notwithstanding this and all that had preceded it mrs stephenson scrupled not to raise her silver voice in the glorious minority of one and to proclaim her positive and complete conviction that either from knavery and mischief or from fun and foolery the report was altogether an invention having no more foundation in truth than a celebrated error which in ages past had assigned to our humble earth the honoured place of centre to the solar system on the appearance of mrs hubert her opinion was eagerly called for by the whole party but her answer was more oracular than satisfactory being summed up in that very safe formula time will show an hour or two followed which were whiled away by coffee and criticism the court circle as a matter of course passed under a general review and then for the gratification of mrs henderson and her sister the only ladies present who had not been that day at st james mrs stephenson entered upon a very graphic description of the dress and appearance of mrs o'donagough and her daughter observing that as all present were either her relations or her relations relations there could be no sort of objection to her speaking with unaffected truth of the general effect produced by them upon all beholders by this time the gentlemen had joined the party and many a burst of irresistible laughter from frederick stephenson attested his continued enjoyment of his pretty wife's powers of persiflage though he ceased not to protest all the time that he did not at all approve quizzing the o'donagoughs that o'donagough himself was a capital good fellow and that he meant to invite them all to dinner to meet seymour very soon at length the clock struck twelve the carriages have been waiting a long time agnes said the general and if we intend to go at all i think we must go now the whole party declared themselves to be perfectly ready but where was elizabeth wait for us one moment said mrs hubert as she left the room to inquire how her daughter had decided 
it was with a very gentle hand that agnes opened the bedroom door for she was not without hopes that she should find her child asleep had she decided upon going thought she we should have seen her in the drawing-room ere this but she was mistaken elizabeth was seated fully prepared for the ball her dress no otherwise differing from that of the morning than by the removal of the train and plume she was reading and her beautiful features showed no traces of their recent emotion you mean to go then my dear love said her mother yes mamma i am quite ready she replied and quickly wrapping her shawl about her she set forth upon an expedition which any one who could have known what was passing in her heart must have allowed required more courage than the mounting many a deadly breach has done End of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty three friendship and love though for some cause which is reasonable to suppose was originated by the retiring timidity of his nature mr o'donagough did not himself go to court he was nevertheless exceedingly anxious to receive a full and true description of all that had befallen his lady and their daughter there and accordingly was in waiting together with the misses perkins to receive them on their return where the deuce have you been staying all this time demanded mr o'donagough the instant his wife's portly person was within the library door for in that sanctum the only spot uninvaded by preparations for the ball were the party to dine and with the exception of the dear interval of dressing recreate themselves till their company arrived what in the world have you been about reiterated mr o'donagough why part of the time my dear we have been in the presence of her most gracious majesty by whom we were received in the most flattering manner possible i am sure i quite long to stay and talk to her she looks so very obliging well and part of the time we were with all the rest of the fine folks you know seeing and being seen donny and i know one young lady by sight at any rate who was pretty tolerably admired i can tell you i never did see a girl stared at as patty was that's the fact god knows i don't want to flatter her and make her vain for i hate it like poison i never was vain myself and i trust my daughter will follow in the same path but truth is truth and there was not a man could pass her without turning round and having another look i am not greatly surprised at that my dear replied mr o'donagough looking very complacently at his glittering daughter patty was a devilish fine girl when she dressed with no finery at all to speak of and i can't say but what she looks all the better for what she has got on now it would have been rather strange if the people had not looked at her i think strange exclaimed miss matilda it would have been downright unnatural you do look beautiful to-day patty and there's no good in denying it even to your face so don't be angry my dear for i can't help it well then if the truth is to be told said miss louisa i won't be afraid to give my opinion even before it is asked and i must say that never in my life did i ever see mrs o'donagough look so beautifully well as she does to-day my goodness how those feathers do become her to be sure after a few more delightful moments such as these patty and matilda ran upstairs leaving mrs o'donagough to explain at length the jocose manoeuvre of her noble friend which had occasioned her late return well patty tell me all did you enjoy it was the opening of the tete-a-tete -tete in the fair debutante's bedroom enjoy it i am sure i can hardly tell whether i did or not it was all done in such a flurry of course i liked to see the people looking at me and for once in her life mamma told the truth for upon my honour and life matilda i don't think that there was one man passed unless perhaps it was some very old ones indeed who did not turn his head round to look at me and they were all i suppose dukes and lords or else baronets at the very least and that is not like being stared at in a common way you know i think not indeed replied her friend with great energy there's many a girl may get a good stare from people at the playhouse you know or anything of that sort who would never get a single look from a lord but i should think patty that you were exactly the sort of girl to produce a great effect at court because you know that when there is such a quantity of rank and fashion as the papers say all brought together in a crowd nobody that was not something particularly striking could hope to be looked at at all i always have said there was something uncommonly striking in you but you have not told me half yet did you see many people that you knew 
yes we saw the stevensons and the huberts and there was another that i saw too that i plagued well i'll be hanged if i didn't nasty false-hearted villain as he is you don't mean sir jack do you yes but i do though and i would plague and torment him into his grave if i did but know the way and dance over it with you know who matilda when i got him there you'll stare perhaps when i tell you that i got hold of his sirship's arm and made my bow of him for an hour and a half by any watch in christendom and didn't i hold him tight i do believe at the very bottom of my heart that he would have had me in the middle of the red sea if he could nonsense patty why should he have given you his arm if he wanted so bad to get rid of you why ask mamma that matilda she did manage it capital to be sure but she didn't know one half quarter the delight i took in it for all that she don't see so far into a millstone as i do and though i don't much think she herself believes all the lies she is so fond of telling about his being still my lover i am quite sure that she has got no notion of what else he's after but i have matilda he is in love now or pretending to be in love which is much the same thing to him good for nothing villain with my way-faced cousin elizabeth and i'll just ask you to guess how well pleased he was at being made absolutely made matilda to let go both miss and madam hubert in order to take mamma and me in tow instead of them oh it was capital fun i promise you and i'll have some more of it to-night for i'll know the reason why but i won't talk any more about it now matilda for i am as hungry as a hound and i won't be plagued all through dinner-time with fearing to spoil my lovely pink satin the spot of grease you know would just be murder i know how i eat when i'm hungry i'm not one of your mincing misses that's afraid to enjoy their food for fear of spoiling either their gown or their complexion or their gentility but i'll just make free with my finery and cover it all up upon the bed till it's time to put it on again for the ball you must help me to take it off matilda for our lady's maid is over head and ears in business about the supper twill be such a glorious supper matilda won't we enjoy it after the waltzing everything being of course out of joint throughout the mansion on this important day mr o'donagough and the four ladies sat down to dinner in the library at five o'clock and from that hour till eight enjoyed themselves in all the luxury of the most unceremonious deshabille eating drinking and planning improvements for all the great and little glories of the coming night but when the clock struck eight patty started up exclaiming now then matilda let us be off there are four of us to dress and only one maid to do it all just let's have a look at the ballroom as we go by as to the supper there's no getting a peep at that without having mamma too for the door has been locked up ever since nine o'clock this morning but i got in once though before they could turn the key and saw sights i can tell you such a trifle matilda and no less than four tipsy cakes while taking their look at the ballroom and admiring all the arrangements for lighting and decoration which like everything else performed by mr o'donagough at this period of his existence was done upon a scale of great expense patty seized her friend matilda by the waist and began dragging her round the room in a waltz don't you long for it to begin said she stopping at length to recover her breath yes i should patty replied matilda in a plaintive voice notwithstanding all i have suffered i really do think i should enjoy it if if what demanded patty whirling herself round and round before a glass why if i was as sure of having partners as you are girls at home are always sure to get the pick of the market as i am replied patty with an expressive wink i can't say anything about that my dear i rather think i am tolerably sure of a partner to waltz with to-night however i'll promise one thing and that is that you shall be served with second best darling girl exclaimed miss matilda with sudden animation anybody that suffered themselves to be out of spirits and unhappy with you would never deserve to have a friend i don't believe that there ever was such a dear kind creature as you are you may depend upon one thing patty that i will stand by you through thick and thin let what will come you haven't said a word yet have you no not i the best time of course must be when they have hundreds of eyes upon them for they can't fly out then you know let them wish it ever so much trust me matilda i'm the girl for a plot and you see if i don't carry it through but not a word upstairs for your life come along it's full time to begin beautifying 
interesting as were the scenes which followed and amusingly diversified as they were by the runnings in and runnings out of those engaged in them from mrs o'donagough's room to patty's and from patty's room to mrs o'donagough's they must not be narrated at length the two miss perkinses were in greater raptures than ever at the uncommon becomingness of everything mrs o'donagough and patty put on and were rewarded for their good taste by having the loan of sundry ornamental baubles bestowed upon them everything is comparative and the magnificent mrs o'donagough and her daughter in all their courtly trappings scarcely entered the ball-room more completely satisfied with their own appearance than did miss louisa in a yellow silk dress set off by a prodigiously massive set of garnets belonging to mrs o'donagough while her head was admirably arranged with a few flowers a few curls and one little red plume all from the stores of the same liberal lady the gentle and now revived matilda wore her white dress adorned at every possible corner with blue bows and white beads which at once decorated the charms of her generous patty at length they were all complete each passed in review before each and each declared that each was perfect now then let us all go downstairs said mrs o'donagough the ball-room was by this time lighted up and blazed away in all the mingled glory of lamps and wax lights well then i never did see anything so beautiful exclaimed the two miss perkinses at once they found mr o'donagough and his friend foxcroft employed in giving with their own hands the last finish to the attractions of the third drawing-room which though last and least of the suite of rooms was by no means either as to their importance in the consideration of their present owner some people may suppose that such social meetings as the present between mr foxcroft and miss matilda perkins must have been awkward and that even the tranquil-minded miss louisa might have felt in some degree embarrassed by his presence but such persons know not mr foxcroft there was a quiet hard dry audacity about him which served his purpose as well as the purest self-approving innocence and so admirably did he sustain the demeanour of a slight but very respectful acquaintance to both the ladies that for very shame they could not testify emotion before the eyes of one so incapable of sharing it there was therefore no drawback whatever to the exhilarating brightness of the scene nor to the throb of satisfaction with which the first thundering knock at the door was welcomed by all another followed and another and another so closely that even the practised looker-on louisa could hardly have ventured to specify which of the many guests came first it was not long before the business of the third drawing-room commenced not indeed that most important part of it for the bringing on of which the whole costly entertainment was arranged but such little skirmishing affairs as sometimes mark the coming on of a battle on which hangs much the plan of mr o'donagough boldly conceived and carried into execution with as strict adherence to his parisian model as the manners of the country would permit had answered perfectly the name of stephenson had certainly helped him in some quarters and that of hubert in others but it is probable that he would have done all he wanted without either a few tolerably good dinners with tolerably good wine a discretion and the power of playing high playing low or not playing at all which followed them had made it easier than some genuine gentlefolks may deem probable for mr allen o'donagough to make up both his dinner-table and his card-table very greatly to his satisfaction but such a mode of life as he was now pursuing was not entered into upon any idle speculation of enjoying a gay existence while it lasted and just winning enough to keep himself clear of ruin when it should be over from the first hour of its conception up to the very important epoch at which he had now arrived one object had been ever steadily before him namely the making prey of some rich unwary novice whose ruin should establish him in idleness and luxury for ever on first becoming acquainted with sir henry seymour in his real character he for a short time really believed patty's positive assurances that the young gentleman was her lover and intended to be her husband which violent improbability could only have been received as truth by such a man as o'donagough from his overweening admiration of his daughter's beauty but the being present at a very few interviews between them sufficed to open his eyes to the real state of the case and he quickly atoned to himself for the gross and stupid blunder of which he had been guilty by dooming the young whist loving baronet to the expiation of all his falsehood in love by the surrender of all his fortune at play mr o'donagough however had yet another blunder to acknowledge in his estimate of sir henry seymour's character 
his losing an occasional rubber at whist when playing at five guinea points was no surer proof of his being a probable victim to the maddening orgies of the gaming-table than his having kissed miss patty was of his intention to convert her into lady seymour and this blunder too mr o'donagough found out without any very long delay but he found out two other things also first that the highly connected young baronet made an excellent decoy duck to his evening parties it being quite enough to mention ça et là that he was one of the whist party to guarantee the perfect respectability of the rather high play sometimes found there the other discovery taught him that whatever advantages the company of sir henry seymour brought were and ever would be at his command so long as the ill-advised young man continued to tremble at the idea of sir edward stephenson's becoming acquainted with the fact of his madcap voyage to sydney with this he had manoeuvred very skilfully never pushing his troublesome friendship so far as to make the young man desperate in which state he might have been tempted to do the wisest thing possible and have opened the whole of his hot-headed but essentially harmless proceeding to sir edward but to this he had never yet been driven and having been made perfectly aware by the admirable tactics of mr o'donagough that he was not expected to be in love with patty he scrupled not to remain on very civil visiting terms with the whole family which with its chief assumed something like a tone of intimacy from the secret which existed between them but though foiled in his hopes of becoming master of the broad lands of sir henry seymour mr o'donagough had not stood the heavy charges of two london seasons in vain he had made money a great deal of money considerably more than he had expended and that too quietly and snugly without any eclat or disagreeable gossip whatever but the time for which he had all along quietly waited was now come and the night of the day on which his wife and daughter had been presented at court the night on which his house was to be sanctified by the presence of many persons not only of high condition but of high character was chosen by him as that on which his great tour de force was to be made among many young men with whom he had made acquaintance at the various clubs to which he had contrived to get admitted was one on whose fair low forehead nature had written gullible in characters not to be mistaken no sooner did mr o'donagough look in the face of this personage than he sought and obtained an introduction to him his next care was to ascertain who and what he was and having learnt upon satisfactory authority that the youth had just thrown off the odious control of a brace of guardians and that he was in undisputed and uncontrolled possession of a fine estate then he cultivated his acquaintance with an assiduity that left the young gentleman very little chance of escaping his friendship this doomed person whose name was ronaldson no longer a canny scotsman however whatever his forefathers might have been was one of those unfortunate but often amiable individuals who are born without the capability of uttering the monosyllable no he was not very wise certainly but there are hundreds of weaker intellect than mr ronaldson who go through life without making any very remarkable blunder merely because they have the power of pronouncing it and are capable upon occasion of exclaiming such a word in due season how good is it but poor robert ronaldson had no such power and when he was asked to dinner he dined and when he was asked to play cards he did play cards and when he was asked to bet he did bet high bets low bets or middling bets precisely according to the invitation given and regulated by no other law whatever the three or four thousand pounds which mr o'donagough had already won from this unfortunate young man had but whetted his appetite and there was such an ungrumbling sans souciance in the manner in which he drew his cheques that the operation of ruining him completely seemed peculiarly fitted for and suitable to such a remarkably good-natured man as mr o'donagough was generally declared to be so that in a word the complete fleecing of mr robert ronaldson was decided upon between mr o'donagough and his chief clerk of the works mr foxcroft and the evening of mrs o'donagough's grand ball fixed on as the time for performing it mr ronaldson was not quite the first but very far from being the last of the invited guests who arrived dancing though it had not yet reached the height of waltzing was begun and a somewhat stiff and sober quadrille was being walked through by way of prologue to the evening's amusement o'donagough had not yet played himself though for nearly an hour past a steady party had been at work in the third room of whom foxcroft was one when mr ronaldson arrived therefore he found the master of the mansion lounging about and criticising the ladies with an air of the most perfect nonchalance and bon ton ah ronaldson how are you are you a dancer adding however before the young man had time to answer not you i'll answer for it you understand life better than that ronaldson 
nothing but the johnny raws are seduced into so very laborious a process for the mere gratification of looking at pretty faces and pretty feet why to say the truth i do not very often dance it is not half so amusing as a game at cards i don't think it is replied o'donagough in a tone of great indifference however i can't let you play cards now because there really are a monstrous number of fine girls here and we must give them a look come with me to that corner ronaldson we shall find it a very snug lookout. the facile young man followed him to the place he indicated and began looking at the ladies as he was told to do having got him there however mr o'donagough made no great exertions to amuse him merely saying from time to time mercy on me what a crowd we shall have it will be perfectly stifling which words accompanied by many expressive yawns and a frequent shifting of the weight from one leg to the other speedily produced the intended effect on his companion who began to yawn likewise and to declare in a tone not the least in the world expressive of pleasure that there was a very great crowd indeed and not a chair to be hoped for exclaimed o'donagough for mercy's sake my dear fellow don't let us stay here stuck up for the show like deals in a timber-yard upon my soul i cannot stand it nor stand any longer let us see if we cannot do better in one of the other rooms to the second drawing-room they repaired accordingly and a very narrow cane bench being fortunately disengaged they seated themselves upon it having before them a pleasant peep now and then across the crowd of the snug comforts of the card-room where the chairs and sofas were of the most luxurious form possible is there any reason why we should not go into the card-room now o'donagough demanded mr ronaldson after having enjoyed the luxury of the cane bench for about ten minutes not if you wish it certainly heaven knows i should prefer it myself for it is the only place that looks comfortable but as this is the first dance you have ever been at here i thought i must do the honours but you are something like me i believe and have no great taste for such tomfooleries and so saying his attentive host now led the way to the soft sofas easy chairs and quiet rubber of the third room ronaldson threw himself into a delightful bergere at the corner of the whist-table and for some time seemed to amuse himself exceedingly well by watching the progress of the game but at length he was again seen to yawn upon which mr o'donagough who had been in the room a little and out of the room a little and in short doing everything that looked the least like being anxious to play said as he again drew near to him don't you think ronaldson we might contrive to make up another table as you don't dance you will find it monstrous stupid if you don't play i should like it of all things replied ronaldson if you think you can be spared from the ballroom oh faith i've done my duty there but i don't see a soul likely to play a real good rubber such as you and i enjoy let us have a game at piquet ronaldson i shall like that better than whist replied the young man for i am a better match for you there you have found that out have you said o'donagough laughing you are quite right certainly but never mind if i lose at piquet with you i'll win at whist with somebody else it all comes wonderfully even at the end of the year within five minutes after he had pronounced these words mr allen o'donagough found himself placed at the very identical little table in the precise chair in the precise corner of the room which exactly the degree of light and no more and exactly the same companion and no other that he had planned and predetermined at least three months before the progress of the game varied but little from what pretty generally happens upon such occasions from the time they began playing till the majority of the company began moving downstairs to supper mr ronaldson won every game with the exception of two which he was permitted to lose that the stimulant of variety might not be altogether wanting when the word supper however caught the ears of the young man who notwithstanding his exhilarating good fortune was by that time very seriously hungry he hinted a wish to follow in the train that was still pouring through the doors but mr o'donagough who seemed vexed and irritated by his continued losses said no upon my soul ronaldson that is not fair you have won pretty well every game and now you are for carrying off the spoil without giving me even a chance of revenge this accusation startled and somewhat nettled the young man who with all his defects was not in the least degree disposed to take an unfair advantage of any one upon my honour o'donagough i had no such idea he replied very gravely i will play after supper as long as you like and for what you like but in simple truth i am very hungry foxcroft your table is up is it not cried o'donagough to his faithful and observant friend yes they are all off to the supper-table replied the accomplished minister 
then do you be off to the supper-table too my good fellow and see that richardson brings us up a tray worth having with a flask or two of champagne it's your deal ronaldson there is nothing i abominate like standing about in a supper-room pushed right and left by a hundred hungry and thirsty women who never dream that any one can want anything but themselves you will do fifty times better here ronaldson you may depend on it likely enough replied his easy companion give me half a chicken and a glass of champagne and i'll play all night if you like it meanwhile the more ostensible business of the meeting was going on in an equally satisfactory manner in the ballroom the party which was really large and brilliant assembled with fewer exceptions from disappointments and excuses than might have been expected and the whirling waltz went on greatly to the satisfaction of patty and now and then of matilda too for about one set in four she was blessed with a partner by a sudden fit of recollection in her devoted friend at a little after midnight mrs hubert and her daughter together with the whole party who had dined with them entered the rooms general hubert was prevented from accompanying them by a gentleman who having called upon him very late in the evening upon business of importance still remained with him in his library when the rest of the party set off for mrs o'donagough's but he sent down a slip of paper to his wife on which was written in pencil i shall come to curzon street the moment i am at liberty send back the carriage for me mrs hubert and the party which entered with her could not have made their appearance in any salon in europe without producing a sensation and it may easily be imagined that mrs o'donagough was not sparing in her efforts to circulate the fact of their very near relationship to herself of all her glorious day this was decidedly the most glorious moment and perhaps in her own heart she might have felt a sort of undefined consciousness that she had reached her culminating point for as she looked round upon the grand display of lights and flowery decorations as she listened to the gay strains of strauss as she marked the grand display of dancing elegance that floated round her and finally as she gazed upon the graceful array of distinguished relatives as they walked up the room she heaved a deep-drawn sigh as if overpowered by the fulness of her contentment sir henry seymour had been for some time in the room and joined lady stephenson mrs hubert and their train the moment they appeared but of all that pair host there was but one who met him kindly nay even that one felt in her heart of hearts that he was unworthy and though when she remarked that all looked upon him coldly a sort of relenting softness led her to still greet him as a friend she would have better liked that the state of things should have been reversed and that as heretofore he should have been welcomed by the smiles of all so that she might have been released from the sort of pitying necessity of being civil but this state of things endured but a short time he immediately asked her to dance and though she agreed to do so merely because she knew not how to avoid it her judgment of him was completely changed before the measure ended little as sir henry seymour had hitherto given his friends reason to admire his deliberative wisdom he had been for some time past giving proofs of it though they knew it not which might well entitle him to respect he had loved elizabeth young as she was almost from the first moment he had renewed acquaintance with her after his return from australia this however was not till they met in paris about a year after the departure of the hubert family from brighton but the feeling she inspired was not at that period at least such as altogether to cast out fear he remembered that the guardian he had so grievously offended was by marriage her uncle and though the reconciliation between them was perfect he dreaded lest the harem scarum reputation of his boyhood might become an impediment to the dearest hope of his life for this reason he very wisely determined to look and love for a while longer and though in spite of all his resolutions he certainly had betrayed both to elizabeth and elizabeth's watchful friends the secret of his heart he had never till this eventful evening breathed a word which could be fairly construed into a confession of love but now though the time of his self-imposed probation was not yet over he could no longer restrain the impulse which urged him at once to avow his wishes and receive his doom more circumstances than one led him to this the evident sensation produced among the critical crowd at st james that morning by the appearance of elizabeth had sent a qualm of terror to his heart from the idea that she must inevitably be asked in marriage by half the peerage in addition to this misery came the outrage to his feelings produced by mrs o'donagough's public seizure of him and his consequent enforced desertion of all he most loved or all he most disliked and to crown all he was by no means slow to perceive in the altered eyes of his friends when he presented himself to them in mrs o'donagough's drawing-room that he had offended them as he could not doubt by his involuntary share in the adventures of the morning 
the resolution upon which he had been pondering from the moment he had bowed himself away from the carriage door of mrs o'donagough became at that moment fixed and unchangeable he had endured to linger with very tolerable philosophy on the threshold of happiness but to see himself thrust from it in consequence of his presumed attachment to the o'donagough race was beyond his strength he determined not to leave the room till he had asked elizabeth hubert to be his wife and he determined too that should her answer be favourable he would not live twenty-four hours longer without exonerating himself from the intolerable thraldom of feeling at the mercy of mr o'donagough by confessing both to sir edward and the general the whole history of his foolish masquerading expedition to australia in both these resolutions he was quite right and for all the wisdom of the first of them he was speedily rewarded by the beautiful simplicity with which elizabeth permitted him to read her innocent young heart how far the closing of that day was unlike its opening to both of them may be very safely left to conjecture while the narrative turns to scenes of rather a different character which were going on at no great distance from them End of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty four a discovery and an elopement there was besides elizabeth one other person of mrs hubert's party who entered the rooms with a spirit preoccupied and nevertheless awake in no common degree to a feeling of deep interest concerning all that might chance to pass there this person was mrs stephenson from the time she had met mrs o'donagough at the house of her father this lively lady had been labouring without intermission to obtain intelligence respecting the source of her newly acquired wealth together with every particular possible to be got at respecting the position and manner of life of mr o'donagough having an extremely clever lady's maid and a saucy french page who could have worked his way through a deal-board as readily as a gimlet had he expected to find either mischief or profit behind it having two such functionaries both very devotedly attached to her and bound in all ways to do her bidding it is not perhaps very extraordinary that she contrived to obtain a few hints which confirmed her in the belief that good mr willoughby's suggestion of a large fortune having fallen into the possession of mr o'donagough was less probable than desirable in short she came to the house fully aware that high play was carried on there and was much inclined to suspect that sir henry seymour's intimacy in the family was owing to this with a great deal of warm-hearted good feeling nora had also a little of that species of animated interest in the affairs of those she loved which sometimes leads to interference more active than judicious most women loving and trusting a husband as completely as she loved and trusted hers would have confided all their suspicions to him and trusted to his management the delicate task of discovering whether the man she had wished to see the husband of her niece was undeserving this happiness either from his being a gambler or an inconstant but no mrs stephenson very greatly preferred managing the whole matter herself and excepting her maid and her page no living being had the slightest suspicion of what she had got in her head for a short time after seymour and elizabeth had stood up side by side for the purpose of walking about a little and talking a good deal to the various airs of a quadrille mrs stephenson took the trouble of moving from one side of the room to the other and back again and then a little on one side and then a little on the other in order to ascertain whether they appeared to be on the same sort of terms together which she had formerly remarked with so much satisfaction it was not very long before she became perfectly satisfied on this point and then she determined to take advantage of having completely separated herself from her party in order to penetrate to the card-room and make her own observations upon what she might find there without being interrupted by anybody the crowd that filled the rooms and which at that time was at its height prevented this manoeuvre from being remarked by any individual of her own party frederick was not there for mr o'donagough having long ago ascertained that he was not a playing man had gradually as his connection increased with those who were made himself less agreeable and less observant so that the acquaintance begun at brighton would have been a decided bore in london had it not tacitly died away by mutual concert without any interruption whatever therefore the enterprising nora made her way across the first room through the second and into the third till she found herself within a few feet of mr o'donagough mr ronaldson their snug little table and their very quiet game of piquet 
she perceived a considerable quantity of gold upon the table which surprised her not but it did surprise her to observe that it was the simple-looking young man who constantly won every game while her strongly suspected acquaintance mr o'donagough as constantly lost without manifesting any symptom of vexation or indeed of emotion of any kind beside mr ronaldson and immediately opposite o'donagough stood mr foxcroft to mrs stephenson this gentleman was totally a stranger nor would his appearance in any way have attracted her attention had she not observed that a slight smile which he sought to conceal by passing his hand across his mouth was perceptible each time that the elder gentleman counted over a handful of sovereigns to the younger one she was quite sure too by the direction of the eyes of both that whatever thoughts produced this smile were in common between mr o'donagough and the gaunt figure from whom it proceeded though nothing in the slightest degree approaching to an answering smile could be perceived on the well-regulated features of the former it was just as she had observed this for the third time and that some vague notion not altogether unlike the truth was growing into very shrewd suspicion in the mind of mrs stephenson that she felt her arm touched by some one beside her and looking round perceived elizabeth peters staring at mr o'donagough very earnestly while at the same time she was calling her attention with more familiarity than their acquaintance warranted i beg your pardon mrs stephenson she said but will you be so kind as to tell me the name of that gentleman opposite it is the master of the house mr o'donagough o'donagough repeated miss peters in a cautious whisper indeed mrs stephenson that is not his real name at any other time it is possible that this abrupt contradiction from a person very nearly a stranger to her might have obtained from mrs stephenson a look of offended surprise and nothing more but in the present state of her mind nothing could be more certain of commanding her attention than such a communication as this she immediately passed her arm under that of miss peters and silently drew her through the crowd till they reached the landing-place on the top of the stairs there comparatively speaking they were alone and mrs stephenson after mounting a step or two of the ascending flight for greater security turned to her surprised companion and said in a tone of the deepest interest tell me miss peters for mercy's sake tell me instantly what it is you mean by the words you just now spoke to me i mean mrs stephenson that unless i am a great deal more mistaken than ever i was in my whole life before that person who you say is the master of the house is major allen a man that i knew very well at clifton very nearly twenty years ago never certainly did any lady in the act of weaving a romance and elucidating a mystery receive a piece of intelligence more well timed or more completely german to the subject of her thoughts my dear miss peters she exclaimed catching the hand of her companion and fervently clasping it are you indeed convinced fully convinced of the truth of what you now assert it is no idle curiosity which makes me ask you this your answer is of real importance indeed mrs stephenson i am and i would not say it unless i was quite sure but how can we account for no other persons having recognized him did not agnes know that major allen and i well remember hearing mr stephenson and the general also talk over that same season at clifton of which you must now be speaking and naming him in a manner that proved they must have known him personally i think miss peters that it is impossible it is not impossible at all mrs stephenson replied elizabeth peters i well remember that neither agnes nor either of the gentlemen you name ever spoke to him at all whereas i was the person to whom he always addressed himself i was very young then and did not find out till afterwards that he was not so gentlemanlike a person as he pretended to be but i was more with my aunt barnaby than any of them and this man was certainly making love to her though it did not come to anything then you may depend upon it that what i say is true i remember every feature in his face but most particularly i remember a wart that he has on the left temple which the wig that he now wears is intended i suppose to cover but while i stood looking at him he wiped his forehead with his pocket handkerchief and just pushed back the hair so that i saw it perfectly i was very sure it was major allen before that but of course i could not have any doubt afterwards and he calls himself allen o'donagough exclaimed mrs stephenson in the softest of whispers and suddenly feeling perfectly convinced of the fact nothing was ever so fortunate as my meeting you here my dear miss peters you will not i am sure refuse to assist me in the project i am bent upon of completely unmasking this detestable man it would be a very righteous thing to do it even without any personal motive but i have many 
will you then return with me to the card-room remain close to me and without attracting attention even by a whisper let us both carefully watch what is going on you have already proved that you have a keen eye i am not quite blind myself and with your help and that of my eye-glass i fully expect to see something worth noting exceedingly well pleased to find herself of more consequence than usual elizabeth peters expressed her readiness to do anything that mrs stephenson wished and once more linked arm in arm they re-entered the card-room together by the time they recovered their position near the little piquet table a murmur about going down to supper began to make itself heard and a movement was already perceptible among the crowd silently pressing the arm of her companion mrs stephenson very skilfully fell back as if pressed upon by the passing throng and ensconced herself and miss peters in a draperied recess which contained a sofa and which might by letting the curtains drop be made exactly to correspond in appearance with the one window of the apartment giving to the irregular room the advantageous effect of two windows instead of one and a niche during the long consultations which had been held between mrs o'donagough and her friend louisa concerning the most advantageous manner of setting off her beautiful rooms for this great occasion nothing had detained them so long as this puzzling recess miss louisa was very strongly of the opinion that the general effect of the three rooms altogether would be a great deal indeed more grand by making it appear that there were two regular handsome windows in the card-room whereas mrs o'donagough herself remembering perhaps the days of silverton and captain tate declared that nothing could look so inviting as that pretty sofa with the draperies festooned before it at length the amiable wife exclaimed we will ask donny about it and miss louisa was accordingly dispatched to the study to invite the master of the house to the consultation well mr o d what do you say to it demanded his wife after fairly stating the pros and cons it had much better look like a window at once my dear he replied i don't want people to be tempted as you call it into sitting in this room at all nobody can enjoy a game at cards unless the room is quiet and though i know just at first that the people will be pushing in and out i am determined to have a quiet hour or two after supper and i shall just lock the door you may depend upon it that is just as you please my dear answered his wife gaily by that time all the people will have seen that we have got three rooms and of course that's all i care about it very well then that's all right but i'd rather you would make the recess look merely like a window if you can and so the discussion ended mrs o'donagough very obediently arranging the curtains of the window and the recess exactly alike but about half an hour before the company began to arrive while mr o'donagough was giving some last instructions to foxcroft in the library and while the two miss perkinses and patty were still indulging in some last looks last pins and last pinches before their looking-glasses above the highly delighted mistress of the fete beguiled those moments of expectation by walking backwards and forwards through what she loved to call her suite of rooms and pushing a bench an inch one way and pulling a chair an inch that in the idle attempt to improve what her heart told her was already perfect in the course of these repeated promenades it occurred to her that the appearance both of the real window and the fictitious one would be greatly more elegant were their draperies partially drawn up disclosing in the one case a small portion of a coloured blind which she greatly admired and in the other a very slight peep into her beloved recess which though not sufficient to induce anybody to penetrate its darkness nevertheless might give the idea of some addition to the extent of which she was so particularly proud this last improvement completed her labours of preparation for the three ladies from above entered the room immediately after and their admiration of her and her rooms and her admiration of them and their dresses left no time for any more finishing touches before the company began to arrive it was then into this dark recess that mrs stephenson and her assistant conspirators slid unobserved of any during the interesting moment when all but the piquet players were pressing forward to supper a slight touch of the finger caused one of the curtains to drop entirely and behind this shelter they seated themselves having by the partial elevation of the other a perfect view of the persons whose proceedings they were about to watch they heard mr ronaldson's petition for supper and mr o'donagough's answer to it they saw the tray worth having brought in by the intelligent-looking richardson they saw mr foxcroft the only individual left in the room besides themselves and the players quietly lock both the doors and then assume to himself the office of butler which he performed with so much zealous gaiety that one flask of champagne was finished and another begun before he attempted to eat or drink anything himself 
neither did mr o'donagough share largely in the conviviality of the moment he professed himself to be quite out of heart from his infernal beating swore that he had never met with any one so completely his master before but declared that if he sat up all night and lost his last shilling he would not give in mr ronaldson whose head was not very capable of bearing steadily either his good fortune or the good wine was beginning to grow loquacious when o'donagough perceiving that the champagne had done all the work he wanted from it at least for the present brought back the attention of the young man to the business part of the entertainment by saying now ronaldson have at you again double or quits double the whole amount of my confounded losses or quits do you agree to be sure i do replied the young man with a jovial laugh what do you take me for for a very honest fellow ronaldson who knowing he has got the advantage in play is willing to let his adversary take a chance from luck just put the tray back upon the other table foxcroft we shall have no more whist to-night i dare say foxcroft obeyed and then placed himself as before behind ronaldson and precisely opposite to o'donagough it was then that mrs stephenson whose interest in the scene passing before her was now worked up to a point that made her utterly forgetful of the awkwardness of her own situation it was now for the first time that she began to comprehend fully the value if not exactly the nature of the telegraphic signs made by mr foxcroft for the benefit of mr o'donagough it was quite impossible unless he had turned himself completely round that ronaldson could even be conscious of mr foxcroft being near him while on the other hand not a glance of the eye or a motion of the finger could escape being seen by o'donagough and that so distinctly that the mere act of raising his eyes for an instant was all that was required to obtain all the information which it was the purpose of mr foxcroft to convey mrs stephenson felt as she said afterwards that she would willingly have staked her own life and almost that of one of her children upon the issue of that game nor would there in truth have been any great risk in doing so the event as all must anticipate was in favour of mr o'donagough who as soon as it was ended said very composedly well then ronaldson now we start fair again i have had a tremendous beating nevertheless nine games to three however i scorn to show a white feather if i lose my devonshire estates must pay for it if you will i am ready to play you again for the same amount as i have now won and i will tell you what i will do besides for i can't endure the idea of turning craven merely because i have met with a better player than myself i will go on with you for six games just write it down foxcroft i will go on with you for six games double or quits every time and rather than let you count me a craven i would go on for a dozen so only i think we shall have had enough of it by that time and the party will be broke up and we shall all be ready to go to bed do you agree to it poor ronaldson who at the freshest hour of the morning would hardly have been capable of judging accurately of the nature and extent of the proposition now offered to him was at this moment as utterly incapable of doing so as if his age had amounted to one lustre only instead of five with a laugh that was very nearly that of imbecility he rubbed his hands and repeated again and again done 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 another and another game was then played of course with the same result as the last the young man's purse and well-stored pocket-book were by that time exhausted upon which foxcroft brought forth writing materials and the half-sobered half-stultified ronaldson set his hand at the termination of the next game to the acknowledgment of an enormous debt mrs stephenson's position now became extremely painful though perfectly certain of the nefarious nature of the transaction that was going on before her eyes she began as her embarrassment increased and her spirits sank to doubt whether she would be able to prove it to others in such a manner as to exonerate the unfortunate young man from the effects of his folly if not she was conscious that in thus quietly looking on and suffering their play to proceed she was making herself a party to the poor victim's ruin a moment's calculation sufficed to show her that the stake if again doubled at the monstrous amount to which it had reached would of itself constitute a large fortune and this again had to be doubled and the amount doubled yet again before the match which she had heard agreed for could be finished as to any change of fortune in the event of the games being played she felt perfectly assured that it could not occur and thus if her fears as to the value of her own evidence were well grounded she should be doomed unless she summoned courage to interfere to see a vast robbery committed which it was most certainly at the present moment in her power to prevent so earnestly had her attention been fixed upon the events of the card-table from the time of her entering the recess that she had paid no attention to the sounds proceeding from the ballroom 
but she now as the fourth game of the match was rapidly progressing to its conclusion listened attentively and became convinced that though the music had not ceased the company were departing she heard many names called upon the stairs a door to which stood open in the middle room and thus at intervals permitted the sounds to reach her despite the closed doors of the card-room the idea that she might if she lingered longer outstay her own party and cause them thereby the most serious alarm as well as place herself and miss peters in a situation the most painfully embarrassing sufficed to screw her courage to the fitting point and as mr ronaldson at the end of a deal said in a trembling voice i am forty-five to your ninety o'donagough and the deal is yours just as these boding words reached her ears she started up and seizing her companion by the arm drew her with her across the room overturning two chairs in her progress and on reaching the door the key of which readily obeyed her hand she turned and said in a voice much more distinct than she herself hoped for play no more young man we have watched the game and know that you have been cheated throw down your cards and play no more your promissory note is not worth a farthing for we can both witness to the manner in which it was won mr ronaldson had sprung from his chair the moment the two ladies had become visible and standing aside to let them pass stared much after the manner he might have done had he seen a spectre mr foxcroft who knew neither of the ladies by sight flew to the door with some vague hope of preventing their going out and whether he thought they might be subsequently pushed up the chimney or thrown out of the window he probably did not know himself at the moment but whatever his projects might have been they were rendered abortive by the door having yielded to the hand of mrs stephenson before he reached it mr o'donagough himself sat immovable nor would it have been easy to perceive from his countenance that anything very remarkable had happened the triumph of perceptibly shaking his philosophy remained for his old acquaintance elizabeth peters who recovering her courage the moment she saw the light streaming in upon them from the now fast thinning rooms forcibly drew back mrs stephenson a step or two and while several passers-by entered from curiosity pronounced very distinctly as she fixed her eyes upon his face i should like to know sir why it is that you go by a false name your name is allen at least you were always called major allen at clifton and that you know as well as i on hearing this and on seeing the many eyes which were by this time fixed upon him the bold spirit of the young quile o'donagough now again major allen was so far moved that he rose from his chair and taking advantage of his accurate local knowledge left the room by a side door which led to a back staircase and was no more heard of that night even the short moment occupied by these startling words of miss peters was sufficient for the drawing together so many of the remaining guests around the door of the card-room that something like a crowd appeared to surround it as the two ladies still pale and strongly agitated passed through it their only object was now to find some member of their own party who might assist their retreat from the scene in which they had played so strange a part but her first glance at the rooms made mrs stephenson exclaim they are gone gracious heaven what terror must frederick be enduring on reaching home and not finding me great indeed was her delight when she perceived general hubert approaching with hasty steps towards the spot where many voices were already discussing the adventure which nobody understood but which everybody was endeavouring to explain thank heaven he exclaimed eagerly receiving the hand which the trembling nora held out to him what does all this mean where have you been hid we have been looking for you in every direction for above an hour frederick is just gone for the second time to see if you have reached home i have guessed it all but for mercy's sake ask no questions now replied mrs stephenson take me away dear general take us both away we have both suffered together we have been shut up looking on a horrid scene for hours yet now it is over i am thankful that we had courage to act as we have done but take us away i implore you if we go now my dear nora replied the general inexpressibly puzzled by her words but convinced that it was no time to ask for explanation if we go now frederick will again miss you agnes is still in the other room nothing could persuade her to leave the house till she was convinced that you were not in it if you will sit down quietly with her for a few minutes stephenson will return and i am sure it will be better for you both miss peters does not look so deadly pale as you do but i feel her arm trembling like your own while this was said the general supported the two ladies whose steps very unaffectedly faltered across the room which divided the card-room from the principal drawing-room but on reaching the door of it instead of finding the quiet he had offered them they were met by a scene which rendered anything like tranquillity in the neighbourhood of it quite impossible 
standing in the middle of the room was mrs o'donagough with hands clasped head dressed dishevelled and her breast heaving with convulsive sobs beside her stood miss louisa perkins with a pocket-handkerchief at her eyes while with the exception of one silent group which occupied a sofa in a distant corner every individual not making part of the crowd now in possession of the card-room stood around her listening to her lamentations and occasionally uttering a word or two of what seemed very unmeaning consolation she is gone she is eloped heaven only knows where and for what where is her father he has got his hands full i dare say but for mercy's sake let somebody go and bring foxcroft to me he shall go oh dear oh dear where shall he go where shall i send him i have no more idea than the child unborn but i am sure and positive as i stand here that it is that horrid vile yellow man with the black whiskers that has taken her does nobody know such a person as don tornorino or tornapino or some such name as that wasn't it louisa dear darling good-for-nothing creature as she is i saw her waltzing away like one possessed with him and when i asked her how he came to be here for goodness knows i never asked him she answered dear wicked clever creature in her own droll way never you mind that mamma here he is and that's enough oh dear oh dear if he does not turn out to be a man of rank and fortune i shall die and break my heart i know i shall such were the sounds that from the crested pride of the unfortunate mrs o'donagough poured forth amidst a torrent of tears and a whirlwind of sighs interrupted at intervals but not checked by the interjections of her hearers how oh, very distressing poor woman it is quite shocking i don't wonder at her being so terrified i am sure if it was my child i should die on the spot such and such like were the only sounds which broke in upon the expression of her maternal anguish till at length while the unhappy lady paused for a moment to blow her nose the gentle voice of miss louisa perkins was heard to say do you think ma'am that there is any gentleman gone off with matilda too never mind whether there is or not replied the anxious mother what can that signify compared to my beautiful patty in such a fortune too as her poor dear father told me this very day that she would be sure of oh it is too cruel of her all this and a great very great deal more in the same strain was uttered by the bereaved lady sometimes sitting sometimes standing and occasionally lying at full length upon a sofa and ever with the much enduring louisa by her side till at length every individual at all within hearing became fully aware that miss patty o'donagough had decidedly eloped with a black whiskered don and that miss matilda perkins had eloped too but whether with her or with anybody else there appeared no evidence to show nothing but the consciousness that her interference could do no good kept mrs hubert at a distance from her really very unhappy aunt during all these lamentations but quite aware that she could render no assistance and being in a state of very painful anxiety respecting the unaccountable disappearance of her sister she remained with mr and mrs henderson who were equally anxious with herself silently waiting for the return of general hubert who had left them for the purpose of once more entering the empty supper-room and once more inquiring of every servant in the hall if mrs stephenson's equipage had been called much too occupied by their own anxiety to remark the absence of their hostess they were not aware that for the last half-hour that unfortunate lady had been employed upon the unpleasing task of convincing herself by various inquiries among her domestics that her precious daughter had most certainly left the house without giving a hint to any one of her intention of doing so and as the black-whiskered don too well remembered as the first-floor lodger in blank street had also suddenly become invisible it was but natural to suppose that he was her companion great indeed was the joy of agnes and her friend mary when their two sisters appeared after their mysterious retreat and greater still was that of mr stephenson who returned in a few minutes afterwards pale vehemently agitated and bringing the terrible intelligence that no tidings could be heard of them it was then that mrs hubert her spirits being relieved from her own great anxiety felt desirous of uttering some word of kindness to her aunt but this now seemed to be rendered impossible by the earnest conversation in which she was engaged with mr foxcroft no no agnes 
said mrs stephenson as she heard her sister proposing to the general that they should before they left the house express some feeling of sympathy with poor mrs o'donagough's alarm about her daughter no agnes you must not speak to her now it is not on account of her daughter's running away that she is looking as horror-struck and terrified as you see her at this moment poor soul she has heard worse news than that but where are lady stephenson and the nivets and where is your dear girl all gone home long ago nora replied mrs hubert then for pity's sake let us go too this is no place for us to remain in how kind you are to question me only with your eyes but tired as i am i am willing to tell you all our adventures before i sleep if my poor frightened frederick feels strength enough left in him to drive to your house for an hour before he retreats to his own the whole party were in truth much too anxious to hear all the mysteries of this strange evening explained to leave them any memory of their fatigue and they all drove together to berkeley square though five strokes from the general's repeater warned them that it was high time to go to rest but who said mrs henderson could rest till this most incomprehensible adventure is explained End of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty five conclusion the breakfast in berkeley square was not an early one but there were other causes for this besides the lateness of the hour at which the general and his lady had retired to rest for general hubert under all circumstances was sure to be in his bathroom by eight o'clock neither was it the protracted slumbers of his lady which retarded the morning meal for though on this occasion he certainly left her fast asleep her waking eyes had seen the light long before the clock struck nine but it sometimes happens that bedrooms and dressing-rooms are used for other purposes than sleeping and dressing the first object which greeted the eyes of mrs hubert as she opened them in consequence of her ears being invaded by a gentle sound near her pillow was her daughter elizabeth in her robe de chambre with her beautiful hair all collected in one nymph-like roll at the back of her small but finely proportioned head and her fair face glowing with an expression of happiness too vivid to suffer drowsy sleep to exist before it will you forgive me mamma you have been waked by a kiss it is i who opened your shutters and drew your curtains is it late dearest said mrs hubert rousing herself with the alertness of an alarmed conscience fearful of having kept a hungry party waiting for breakfast make the tea elizabeth do not mind me i shall be down very soon but i don't want you to be down very soon mamma replied elizabeth laughing and blushing beautifully at the same time i want to speak to you first let me be your lady's maid to-day may i willingly dear love said her mother accepting an offered kiss and shrewdly suspecting the subject of the offered conference she wrapped a dressing-gown round her slipped her feet into her quilted satin slippers and seating herself on the sofa at the bottom of the bed said now darling sit down close beside me and tell me all you have got to say not unless you will dress yourself mamma and going to the proper receptacles of stockings and shoes she found all that was needful and held them with pretty obsequiousness to her mother's hand mrs hubert looked up into the face of her daughter as she took them but the fair conscious girl turned away from the speaking glance with that true feminine shyness which would be wooed and not unsought be won even to speak the word she had come expressly to utter there would have been something pretty to watch in the struggle between this shyness and the wish to disclose the secret that was bursting from her lips but on such an occasion a mother's heart has no leisure for such speculations and sympathizing with elizabeth though she could not quite be said to pity her she threw her arm round her and pressing her to her bosom exclaimed seymour loves you elizabeth and last night he told you so is it not this he would disclose to me the only answer for a minute or two was a fond clinging return of the embrace and a shower of happy tears shed on the maternal bosom you guessed it then she said at length ah oh, mamma how cruelly we wronged him i thank heaven for it elizabeth replied her mother and he may well forgive a wrong which had its origin in such feelings as ours towards him oh yes mamma he is quite aware of that i do not believe he is at all inclined to complain of that or of anything else papa will be so kind as to see him this afternoon will he not and why not this morning elizabeth i don't know mamma henry said the afternoon i suppose he must have some business then observed mrs hubert 
for of course he must be very anxious to see your father he is very anxious my dear mother and very anxious to see you too replied elizabeth in a pleading tone indeed indeed you must never suspect him again of feeling anything that he ought not to feel from this point the conversation proceeded with about equal pleasure to both parties and it was not till a multitude of pleasant things had been said and listened to that mrs hubert stopped the course of them by exclaiming i am very glad elizabeth that this explanation took place between you last night i should have felt more perfectly ashamed of our suspicions i think than i do now if the first removal of them from your mind had been produced by an event of which you are still both ignorant instead of by the much more agreeable mode of his confessing his affection for you what event mamma demanded elizabeth our unfortunate cousin patty eloped last night from her father's house replied mrs hubert oh mother have i not reason to be glad that i had courage enough to go to the party last night you know not oh you can never know how i dreaded it but i thought it was right i thought it was less weak less indelicate than remaining at home to weep over departed hopes which i then thought i must have had no right to form had i yielded to this weakness mother might it not have been said that he only proposed to me because he had lost her i don't know my dear replied her mother laughing it is strange how much darkness may be dispelled by one little gleam of light it now seems to me to have been so perfectly absurd in us all to imagine for a moment that henry seymour could be in love with patty o'donagough that the idea no longer appears admissible but what i might have thought without this gleam of light i know not i wish mamma said elizabeth that you would tell papa what has happened before i see him at breakfast you are all but dressed now may i send claridge to tell him that you wish to see him in your dressing-room and why not tell him yourself dearest because i do not like to see him again till he knows all well then send claridge to him it was with feelings of happiness as pure and unmixed as those of her young daughter that mrs hubert communicated to her husband the disclosure which had been made to her but to her very great disappointment he shook his head ominously as he listened to her my dearest hubert are you not pleased by this news said she looking anxiously in his face i trust in heaven that you know nothing against this young man for that our elizabeth's happiness depends upon him is most certain agnes he replied i doubt if i have feelings of much stronger partiality towards my own sons than i have felt towards sir henry seymour i have liked and loved the boy from childhood upwards and though from a feeling of respect for sir edward i never uttered the opinion i blamed much less than i sympathized with the feelings of the ardent young man when he rebelled against the authority which insisted upon his submitting to a routine of education for which he was not fitted therefore i freely allow that all the ill behaviour of which we heard so much before he reappeared from his self-banishment has left no painful impression on my mind whatever no agnes it is what has happened since that has displeased me as to the idea that henry seymour intended to marry our red-cheeked young cousin i never entertained it for a moment but that he has paid her a very unwarrantable degree of attention i do believe and this whether it proceeded from fun or fondness is equally at variance with the character i should desire to find in the husband of elizabeth i should agree with you perfectly hubert did i believe it but what better authority have we for this unwarrantable degree of attention than for lord mucklebury's history of the intended marriage if you reject the one i cannot understand how you can receive the other because in the one case i have no proof nor ever had any beyond vague report while in the other i have the evidence of sir edward on what occasion hubert the occasion to which i particularly allude occurred but yesterday you know he was detained at st james till long after you left it and in coming away he saw sir henry seymour and miss o'donagough arm in arm and tete a tete at the bottom of the staircase as no lady and gentleman could possibly be seen without drawing upon themselves a degree of observation that sir henry seymour ought to have been desirous to avoid believe me montague i can explain all that to you and mrs hubert described with the most graphic truth sir henry's enforced surrender of herself and daughter in consequence of the manoeuvring of mrs o'donagough i confess she added that at the time i was very angry with him because it seemed to me that no man could feel himself obliged to yield such very civil acquiescence to any arrangement that did not accord with his inclination but surely the declaration of last night is sufficient to convince us that it was no partiality of any kind for miss o'donagough which induced him to yield to my unfortunate aunt's attack upon him 
after all that has passed between us on the subject my dearest agnes you will not think me too completely a convert to the opinions of aunt betsy if i confess to you that what i most object to in the business is sir henry seymour's having any acquaintance at all with the o'donagoughs or allens or whatever their real names may be the case was far different with us dear love when mrs compton blamed us so severely for our civilities to them at brighton in our case the alternative was a rude and almost cruel avoidance of a very near relation but no such apology can be offered in the case of seymour in the highest paroxysm of her displeasure aunt betsy never suspected either of us of seeking their society from preference we however can by no possibility assign any other cause for the familiar intercourse which has unquestionably existed between them and sir henry i have never encountered this wretch o'donagough allen anywhere without his alluding to seymour's having recently dined with him more than once i have questioned the young man with as great an air of indifference as i could assume to ascertain whether the statement were true or not and though he certainly stammered and coloured and looked very heartily ashamed which in my judgment by no means made the matter better he never denied that it was true i do not like this agnes it shows a species of coarseness or at best of indifference in the selection of acquaintance which your elizabeth dearest is as little likely to relish as her sweet mother mrs hubert sighed deeply there was too much apparent truth in these painful observations for her to attempt to reason them away yet she felt that if they were to be the means of separating sir henry and elizabeth they would bring a degree of certain misery greatly disproportioned to their importance as usual her husband seemed to read her thoughts for he added immediately do not however fancy my dear love that i have any desire to separate these young hearts it would be making poor henry pay a heavier penalty for his folly than it deserves but i think you will agree with me in advocating a longer period of probation and delay than would have been necessary had there been no such symptoms of levity the adventures of last night of all which he is probably still ignorant will assist pretty effectually in opening his eyes to the character of his strangely chosen friends let not our dear girl have her feelings wounded by a single word of all this the breakfast at which the young emily and her good governess were present passed off as such agitating meetings should always be permitted to do a look a smile a silent kiss said all that it was necessary to say and when it was ended elizabeth retired to her own room astonished at her own composure and capable of enjoying without any drawback whatever the dear delight of meditating for the first time with the privileged freedom of sanctioned love upon the unspeakable happiness that awaited her when general hubert and his wife were again left alone elizabeth and sir henry were for a moment forgotten while they discussed together the terrible discoveries of the previous night the testimony of mrs stephenson and miss peters was too clear to leave the slightest doubt respecting the character of the man with whom the widow barnaby had connected herself nor had they either of them any doubt that he was in truth the identical major allen who had caused them both so great annoy nineteen long years ago at clifton it wanted no warning voice from aunt betsy to awaken the general to the necessity of separating himself and his family now and for ever from all intercourse with so infamous a personage but he half frightened the gentle agnes by telling her that he was expecting frederick stephenson to call upon him for the express purpose of paying a visit in curzon street we mean to tell him said the general that we recommend his immediately taking measures to leave the country in order to avoid the dangers of a legal process which would be very likely to terminate in his being obliged to do so in a much less agreeable way would it not be better hubert to leave him to his own devices said his wife no agnes not in this country at least he cannot be permitted to remain here after the double discovery of last night frederick is extremely anxious that he should be off immediately for as long as he remains in the country he will be living in dread of his wife's being called into a court of justice to give evidence of the fraud of which she was a witness miss peters too will live under the same terror and indeed agnes i think it desirable for all our sakes that he should leave england as early and as quietly as possible you cannot doubt my being of the same opinion montague replied mrs hubert i only dreaded for you the extremely disagreeable operation of telling him so fear not for that agnes the visit will be a very short one depend upon it besides the real motive we have the ostensible one you know of inquiring if they have received any news of miss o'donagough mr stephenson was punctual to his appointment and the two gentlemen set out together for curzon street to the question is mr o'donagough at home 
the answer given was no sir short and decided is mrs o'donagough at home i don't know sir was the hesitating reply be so good as to tell her that a gentleman wishes to see her on very particular business please to walk in sir said the small and incautious page opening the dining-room door for them and then galloping up the stairs we had better follow him frederick or the affair will be endless suggested the general i agree with you answered his companion and before the little page had half delivered his message general hubert and mr stephenson were in the room the business which had brought them there was more likely to arrive at a speedy conclusion than they had hoped for when they entered it for greatly to their surprise they found assembled in the second drawing-room a group consisting of mr and mrs allen o'donagough their daughter the yellow gentleman with black moustache and whiskers and the two faithful perkinses besides i will not apologize for disturbing you major allen said general hubert advancing though i did not expect to find you here when i entered the business which brings us here is yours and not our own and cannot as i think you will allow be considered as an intrusion but it may perhaps be more agreeable to you to converse with us in another room major allen measured his two visitors with his eye and then threw a glance towards the dawn but whatever his first thoughts might have been his second which are proverbially the best induced him to rise from his chair and with a very dignified demeanour to marshal general hubert and mr stephenson into the next room the eventful scene of the last night's misadventures nay he even moved his hand in token that they might be seated but this hospitable notification did not appear to be noticed for neither gentleman accepted it my business with you sir said the general need not detain us long a very disagreeable accident made a lady for whom both this gentleman and myself are nearly interested the witness to a most nefarious transaction in which you were the principal agent it has also come to our knowledge that you are the same person who many years since at clifton was implicated under the appellation of major allen in a transaction which if i mistake not caused you to be sent out of the country perhaps sir as a citizen i should be doing my duty better by mentioning these facts to a police magistrate but i wish from motives purely selfish i confess that you should now leave england by your own act instead of that of the legislature but this if done at all must be done promptly a very short time will probably render it too late are you ready sir to give me an assurance that you will depart immediately if not or if hereafter i should find such assurance falsified i shall find myself obliged however reluctantly to obtain the same object by a process that will not depend upon yourself major allen was as usual exceedingly well dressed and his wig greatly relaxed in its wavy outline since he made his first reappearance at brighton was a perfect model for the head of a middle-aged man of fashion though his visitors stood he had seated himself in a deep armchair and assumed the attitude rather of one who was passing judgment than receiving it during the greater part of general hubert's address to him his countenance might have been studied in vain for any expression indicative of what was passing within but at its conclusion a mocking smile took possession of his features and looking at each gentleman steadily in the face for a minute or two he said i am really too happy in finding that my nearest connections and myself agree so entirely respecting the little experiment in steam navigation for which i am preparing pray sir to general hubert remember me very affectionately to my charming niece agnes and believe me to be your very obedient humble servant john william patrick allen o'donagough a strong emphasis was laid upon the last word for the purpose probably of making his auditors understand that he was aware of and appreciated the privilege by which every man has a right to designate himself by any appellation which he may choose to select having uttered this speech he permitted himself the audacious gratification of another steady stare at them both and then rising with an air of great hauteur and deliberation stalked through his favourite side door and closed it after him convinced that the business upon which they came was satisfactorily executed the two gentlemen were too well pleased by knowing that it was over to feel any inclination to quarrel with the manner of their reception after a moment's consultation they agreed that it would be better to visit the unfortunate mrs allen o'donagough for whom they felt much compassion a civil good morning and therefore prepared to make their retreat by passing through the room by which they had entered no symptom however of any feelings which called for compassion seemed to exist amidst the party they once more came upon mrs allen o'donagough was lying at full length upon a sofa squeezed in at the foot of which perched miss louisa perkins 
in full view of the well-pleased maternal eye upon another sofa sat the yellow gentleman and patty extremely close beside him her arm lovingly thrown round his neck while the fair matilda with eyes full of very melancholy tenderness and her tall figure sustaining itself against the mantelpiece stood watching them general hubert was about to utter something like a friendly farewell but mrs allen o'donagough gave him no time for it you are making us an early wedding visit i must say gentlemen but it is all very right and proper between near relations give me leave to introduce to you my married daughter madame espartero cristinino salvator mondi tornarino these names she read from a paper ingenuously attached by a couple of pins to a cushion of the sofa that was exactly within reach of her eye you see general i have had the good fortune to marry my daughter before you have married yours and to a man of extremely high rank too permit me to present to you i beg pardon permit me to present you to don espartero cristinino salvator mundi tornarino my son-in-law neither you nor frederick stephenson have any title you know and therefore it is of course proper that you should be presented to him and not he to you i am sure i heartily hope that my great-niece elizabeth may do as well but by the by general i think it is but fair to give you a hint about that young scamp henry seymour it's no thanks to him if my daughter is married to a man of title and quality it would have been all the same if his false-heartedness had driven her to marry a mere nobody which with my high spirit and exalted feelings would certainly have broke my heart but it is not only his abominable falseness in love-making that i think it right to mention i wish also to let you know that there is a secret which he has taken the greatest of all possible care should never come to any of your ears you none of you guess i believe that the young scapegrace was off to australia when his penitent fool of a guardian thought he had shut himself up somewhere all in the dumps because of their quarrel when we were good friends together he told us all about it and if he had behaved as he ought to have done i would never have said a word to anybody on the subject but he has provoked me i won't deny it how did you find out he had been to australia mrs o'donagough demanded the general did you get acquainted with him there no not i general but i know it just as well as if i had for we all came to england in the same ship and it was then that you became acquainted with him yes to be sure it was now then madam said the well-contented general hubert we will wish you good morning and with a slight bow to the whole party the two gentlemen turned to leave the room i say cried madame espartero cristinino salvator mundi tornarino calling after them don't you forget to tell my cousin elizabeth what a famous lark i have had she must be sure to come and pay me a wedding visit on returning to berkeley square general hubert found his wife and daughter very anxiously gazing upon the outside of a large packet which had just been left at the door by the servant of sir henry seymour rightly guessing that it contained a confession of the exploit of which he had just learnt the particulars from mrs o'donagough he fearlessly opened it in their presence it contained more than one sheet of closely written paper and detailed at length and with very amiable penitence the history of his escapade the rebellious feelings which had led to it the very unpleasant acquaintance that it had entailed upon him and lastly with all the eloquence of deep feeling it explained how his ardent love for the general's lovely daughter had rendered galling the idea of appearing more wild and ill-conducted in the eyes of her family than he had yet done and induced him to endure the martyrdom of propitiating the good will of mr o'donagough in order to secure his secrecy then sir henry it seems has not taken more pleasure in the acquaintance than ourselves general hubert said agnes with a very happy smile thank heaven that i know it he replied joyously and now my sweet elizabeth he added fondly embracing his blushing daughter i can tell you with a safe conscience that i know not another to whom i could resign the charge of making you happy with so firm a conviction that the precious trust would be executed faithfully who needs to be told that the young elizabeth's bridal was a gay one when it was known as a certainty that the allen o'donagough family together with their illustrious son-in-law were actually departed for the united states mrs hubert ventured to write a full true and particular account of all their recent adventures to her aunt mrs elizabeth compton 
announcing at the same time that her company was earnestly entreated at the approaching wedding and assuring her that she should meet there no nieces but such as she had too long honoured with her love for them to feel any doubts as to her pleasure at a reunion the delight of the still active old lady on receiving this letter was great indeed she could not have died happy and she knew it so long as the barnaby was an inhabitant of the same land as the huberts a dread of mischief and disgrace arising from the incongruous connection perpetually haunted her and in so serious a shape as very materially to disturb her tranquillity but she now felt that the danger was over for ever and immediately wrote an acceptance of the joyous invitation in a tone of heartfelt happiness that caused tears of pleasure to dim for a moment the beautiful eyes of the bride-elect of all the guests assembled at those splendid nuptials there was not one perhaps who excited so universal a degree of interest as herself all sought to do the venerable and animated old lady honour and no one could receive their honours more gaily or more gracefully giving throughout the whole day but one slight indication that she still could be a little mischievous if she chose it and that was by whispering in the general's ear when emily was assisting in distributing the wedding-cake after breakfast do you mean to send any wedding-cake across the atlantic dear general end of chapter thirty five the end of the widow married a sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope recorded by celine major